Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll talk about the canonization of Blessed John the 23rd and Blessed Pope John Paul II. So please stay with us. You're welcome, my Father Mitch Paco, and welcome to EWTN Live, which is our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Our guest tonight is the author of more than 20 books, including a world-renowned biography of soon-to-be Saint John Paul II. He's also a well-respected commentator on the faith and the Catholic Church. So please welcome George Weigel. George. Hi, Father. Good to see you again. Good to see you, too. When I came here to EWTN uh, over 12 years ago, I knew that I would be teaching the writings of John Paul. There, there are so many John Paul cheerleaders. He was still alive, of course, at that time, but not enough John Paul readers. So we've been going through his encyclicals, all of his exhortations, paragraph by paragraph. And as I started that process, I read a number of biographies of John Paul. And yours was the last. And it really struck me how the difference in quality was uh, similar to that of what I heard from my father about the facts of life versus what I heard from the guys on the street. A lot of the data was similar, but it was in a totally different context, one being much better than the other. And I, I really appreciated that. How did you get that kind of perspective and insight into John Paul? I had read several of the previous biographies too, and they're frankly the reason why I decided to write Witness to Hope. Uh, these previous works had treated John Paul II from the outside. He was dealt with as a political figure, a statesman, someone on the world stage. There was no sense of him as a radically converted Christian disciple, as a priest, a bishop, the Bishop of Rome. And as one uh, review of one of those previous books said, describing the problem you described, this is like writing a biography of Michael Jordan without talking about basketball. Yeah. You're just not going to get to the inside of the guy and what makes him uniquely himself. I don't think any of them really understood uh, his philosophy, what his personalist and phenomenological philosophy was. They just couldn't grasp that, which was a major component of his background. Well, I, even more basically than that, I think you have to start with John Paul II, with Carol Wojtyla, as a Christian disciple. Yes. He, he once said to me, speaking of other biographical efforts, they try to understand me from the outside, I can only be understood from the inside. <laughs> so that was a challenge to me to figure out what that inside was. And it is no accident that the first part of Witness to Hope, the prologue, is simply called the Disciple. And the last part of the second volume, the end and the beginning, 1700 pages later, <laughs> talks about the radical <coughs> Christian discipleship of Carol Wojtyla. That is the beginning and the end, the end and the beginning mm -hmm. of the story of his life. Then you have this remarkable mind which grasps in a very powerful way the human crisis of the 20th century, the crisis in the idea of the human person, mm -hmm. which crisis had led to all sorts of crazy politics, 
which had led to tens and indeed hundreds of millions of violent deaths, including deaths by abortion. And he figures all of that out, and he marries a contemporary philosophical method to the tradition of the church, and suddenly the tradition of the church begins to take on fresh aspects yes. and can, can, can speak to the particular situation of human beings in the late modern and postmodern world. Then on top of that, I think, was a unique uh, spiritual life that was in one sense deeply traditional, mm -hmm. uh, a man of many rosaries every day, a man of daily mass, the divine office, all of the normal things we would expect, but also a man of mystical gifts, uh, a man of uh, deep spiritual <coughs> intuition into what the world needed to experience in the late 20th century, and that, of course, was the divine mercy. Uh, John Paul II's lifting up divine mercy as, in one sense, the, one of the great themes of his pontificate, was not simply lifting up a distinctive Polish experience from the 1930s and the visions of Sister Faustina. It was a penetrating insight into the human condition in the late 20th century. That all of that awfulness that had gone on in two world wars and three totalitarian systems and the greatest persecution of the church in history had, had kind of torn great rips, holes in the moral fabric of humanity that could only be healed by an experience of the divine mercy. Finally, I would say from the inside out, uh, this was a man with a remarkable ability to see around the corners or to see over walls and to perceive opportunities where others only perceive difficulties or perhaps impossibilities. Yes. Two great examples of that were in the late 1980s, I think long before the political world figured this out, certainly before the world of talking heads figured this out, John Paul II understood that the communist project was finished and that it was time to start thinking about a post-communist Europe. Uh, in a similar way, he understood that the year 2000 was not just a matter, uh, matter of uh, computer bugs, or a lot of parties on New Year's Eve. This was, this was a turning point in human history. It was a turning point in the history of the church. And so without a lot of support from inside the Roman Curia or even among the bishops of the world, uh, he launched the church into the great jubilee of 2000, uh, which became an extraordinary experience that in its own turn, became the platform by which he launched the church into the new evangelization of the third millennium. One part of the, the book that you uh, brought up and uh, that I remember participating in at that time was that 10 years of preparation for the millennium of Christianity in Poland. You know, how they, you know, he, that was a model for him, that for 10 years within the communist system, the bishops still prepared the people to understand their identity comes from the church. They were just barbarians roaming around until Mieczysław the I wanted to become a Christian. And that preparation was something that he also saw as a follow-up of Vatican II, preparing for the synod of his diocese and then preparing for the year 2000. He saw the importance of those kinds of preparation periods to let people take these different events seriously. Yeah, the great novena in Poland prior to the millennium of Polish Christianity in, in 1966 was an extraordinary business. It was 
conceived by Cardinal Vyshinsky yes. while he was under house arrest in 1953-1956. He put those years to work in planning the recatechesis of the entire country in preparation for this celebration of the millennium of Polish Christianity and the baptism of uh, Prince Mieszko in uh, 966 to 1966. Uh, and it was, as one Polish priest said to me, it was those young people we catechized in freezing cold church basements in 1960, 62, 64, who 15 years later were the people at the shipyard gates in Gdansk exactly. making the solidarity movement. So not only was there a reconsecration of the country spiritually in 1966, that had concrete, specific, human, and ultimately political effects on the course of, uh, on the course of history. Yeah, the, the and death, John Paul II, I think, communism. learned from that, uh, as he had learned from the intense interest in anniversaries in, in Polish history, Polish culture, that uh, these can be occasions for more than blowing out candles on a cake. Uh, these for, can be occasions for reclaiming your identity in a way that leads you with new energy into the future, and I think that's the lesson he applied to the Great Jubilee of 2000. There were the three years of preparation for that, mm -hmm. Trinitarian, as you remember, right. Father, right. Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and then there was the extraordinary event of the Great Jubilee itself, which John Paul II always said was the key to his pontificate. Yes. Why was that? Because, in a sense, when he went to the Holy Land in March of 2000, he carried the whole church with him so that the church could experience again the reality of salvation history. Yes. This is not just a nice story. This is not one spirituality in a supermarket of spiritualities. Real things happen to real people in real places that you can touch today at a definable moment in history. And the changes that happened in those people by becoming friends of Jesus of Nazareth, by becoming disciples of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, changed the course of, of world history. It's also, uh, I, I think, important, um, let's see, two other things. Uh, one, he uses Second Corinthians 13, verse 13, in terms of that preparation, beginning with the, um, he starts off with the Son, then the Father, then right. the Spirit, using St. Paul's line that we still use as one of the introductory greetings at Mass. Right. And that that was how he also dealt with his first, the, the, the first encyclicals, not the very first, but he began right. with Redemptor Hominis. Right. And then the next piece of that was uh, Rich in Mercy on the Father, right. and then uh, Dominum of Vivicantum on the Holy Spirit. And he used that same pattern. Talk a little bit about why understanding the persons of the Trinity is so much part of his theology, philosophy, and the view that he wants to bring. John Paul II understood that our theology of the Trinity, uh, in, an, in an interesting and, and perhaps slightly shocking sense, is not just about God alone. Mm -hmm. Because if we are made in the image and likeness of God, then we are made in the image and likeness of the Most Holy Trinity. Right. Which means we too are made for community, for communion, for a communion of persons. We are made to be gifts for others as our own lives are gifts to us. The Holy Trinity is a communion of absolute self-gift and absolute receptivity. And that imprint of giving and receptivity 
is in the human soul. That's in our spiritual DNA. And the more we understand the Trinity as a communion of persons in radical self-gift and radical, self, uh, radical receptivity, the more we can understand ourselves as people called not to live for me, myself, and I, the unholy Trinity, <laughs> but to live our lives as a gift to others as indeed each of our lives is a gift to us. None of us is the cause of our own existence. Exactly. None of us is the cause of our own existence. Our life is sheer gift. That's not just a fact of biology. That's a deep truth about the human condition from which certain moral lessons can be discerned. And then what he would do as a philosopher in the 1950s, Carol Wojtyla, is to take that religious insight and try to work it through philosophically so you can make a case for the Christian view of the moral life in a way that makes sense to generally confused and sometimes deracinated uh, people living in a late modern world in which people often think there's nothing called the truth, there's only your truth and my truth. Right, right. And uh, part of the, this view that he had was also a tremendous focus on the dignity mm -hmm. of each person. Certainly uh, an amazing perspective after having been live through the most degrading experiences of human dignity under the Nazis and the communists, that their refusal of God, their hatred of God, also became a hatred of human person and dignity, and that this led to, again, mass death. Mm. Oh, I, I always notice, I think you've seen too, um, at the University of Hawaii, they have this uh, section on their website about, you know, causes of mass de democide, you no know, huge deaths. In, in 2,000 years of Christianity, it's about 2 million people, including crusades and so on, and, and the Inquisition, that's all, that's all they could find, where, which is bad enough. But atheists and other governments that were anti-God, anti-faith, are hundreds of millions sure. in the 20th, between 1914 and 1990 alone. And he comes up with this sense of dignity being, you know, flowing from God's dignity. And this is key to, uh, for the gift that he's given people in the modern world. John Paul II was very aware of the truth that was identified by your fellow Jesuit father, Henri de Lubac, in the mid-1940s in a book called The Drama of Atheist Humanism, when de Lubac wrote that modernity has proven that it's not true that you can't organize the world without God. You, you can organize the world without God, but men can only organize the world without God against each other. Yes. People who try to organize the world without reference, particularly to the God of the Bible, not to some generic God, yes, but yes. to the God of the Bible, are only going to organize it against each other. Now, it's important, I think John Paul II insisted in, after the Cold War, to recognize that that temptation was not only a temptation of the great totalitarian systems of the mid-20th century. This is not just a temptation mm -hmm. of fascists, Nazis, communists, whatever. This uh, temptation is built into utilitarianism to... We, explain of, what utilitarianism means. Well, the, the measuring of human beings by their usefulness rather than their inalienable and innate dignity. Exactly. Are you a useful or useless person? Are you a burdensome person or a person who's pulling their weight? Right. 
And of course, that usefulness is always defined mm. by somebody other than the person. Yeah, of course. Um, but this, this is what has led to the uh, terrible crisis of abortion throughout, throughout the world. It's what is increasingly leading to uh, state authorized, which will soon mean state required euthanasia. Yes. Um, this is uh, what keeps people in welfare dependency, right. is a kind of utilitarian calculus of let's, let's, if we can't make these people useful, let's at least keep them unburdensome, well, rather the, than unleashing the talent and the gifts that are within them. Uh, you, you see this in the kind of argumentation that uh, <clears throat> former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi made with George Stephanopoulos, saying we have to fund birth control and abortion. Think of all the money we'll save. That was her argument. And he checked on that. Well, the, the issue is, at the first year of life, you're very expensive. But then, as you point out, the logical conclusion is the last year of life is even more expensive than the first. So will the state inevitably require that euthanasia? Because like Speaker Pelosi said, you've got to save money. And it's just it's, that utilitarian value with no sense of the dignity of suffering or of the origin of life. I think it's very important for us to recognize that, that figuring this out, is not some peculiarly Catholic thing. Mm -hmm. the, these questions of abortion and euthanasia, to take two examples, are in our American context questions of fundamental constitutional order. Mm -hmm. These are first principles questions of politics. If the state, in this case the federal government, arrogates to itself, successfully claims that it has the authority to declare an entire class of indisputably human beings, namely the unborn, outside the protection of the law so that lethal violence can be done to them without consequence. There's no reason in principle why the state can't declare that of other classes of indisputably human beings, like, to use your example, people who are getting a little bit burdensome on the health care system in the last years of their lives, or the radically handicapped, or, the un or, or people with Down syndrome. This is a prescription for uh, the brave new world, and it has to be resisted by people of goodwill, whatever their uh, faith commitments or lack thereof. Now, for us, this is fundamentally a matter, matter of discipleship. We see in that unborn child or that elderly person with Alzheimer's or that 18-year-old with Down syndrome or somebody who's in a terrible automobile accident and is severely handicapped the rest of their lives, we see Christ in a very disturbing disguise, as Mother Teresa would have put it. Yes. And, and that's why we respect that person. But and you can also get to that understanding that, that these practices are seriously bad news for society by a very simple reflection on how much power do you want the state to have. And there's, there's a certain element. Um, you know, Blessed John Paul was quoted as saying, um, that he wanted to age before the world and he to see that he still had the same dignity as he had as a young 58 year old pope and as an aging and weaker and weaker pope but he maintained that dignity and the love of him in that you know, debilitated situation was so manifest by the vigil during his, as he was in the process of dying, and then of course at his funeral. So that he was trying to 
not only teach it, but live it out. In the second volume of my biography of John Paul II, The End and the Beginning, I call the chapter on the last four months of his life the last encyclical, because that's exactly what I think that was. That was his last great teaching moment in which he had the humility and the pastoral insight to invite the whole world into his Passover, as he called it, not so that people could watch him, so that people could experience through him the mystery, the Paschal mystery, of the death and resurrection of the Lord. That was his last great priestly offering to the world, because that's what Catholic priests are for. They are to offer the world an experience of the Paschal mystery, primarily in the Holy Eucharist, but also in their manner of life. And that is what John Paul II did at the end of his life. And as you say, the extraordinary response to that throughout the world was a powerful witness to the enduring power of the gospel. Yeah, and I think that that's, uh, you know, he not only gave us a vision for the church going forward for the next millennium, that is a, a vision he could put into words, but it was truly a vision he could live by the ease with which he was with young people, the way that he could deal very cleverly with politicians, and the way that he could go all the way to the end in his dying. Every aspect of this was showing us a way forward, and that's uh, one of the things that is tremendously lovable about him. It was also one of the things that made life a little difficult for his biographer because uh, <laughs> he, uh, he was never a rear-view mirror guy. He That's was, one of your great lines. He was a guy who was always looking, looking ahead. And I very well remember the first time we sat down at Castel Gandolfo in September 1996 to, to get serious about working on this biography. And I had a long memo of questions I needed to work through over the next couple of years. And he immediately started peppering me with questions about what's going on and so forth, the usual tenor of our conversations before that. And I just said, time out. For the next two and a half years, I'm the one who gets to ask the question. <laughs> and we're going to have to start looking back, not just ahead. We've got to look at a break because that's I'm looking ahead to what's coming up next. So we'll take a break and then I'll let you come back and talk about Blessed John the 23rd. Right. So please stay with us. Welcome back. And first of all, of course, we'd love to invite you to be part of our studio audience. If you have a chance to come down here to Alabama, please do so. Contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966, or you can go to the website www.ewtn. Dot com, and they will give you all kinds of information about places to stay, uh, the various scheduling of programs, masses, and instructions on how to get up to Hansful. 
uh, to go pray up there with the sisters as well. We're going to continue on our discussion with George Weigel because we haven't even begun to talk about uh, Blessed John the 23rd. Um, he was Pope when I was in grammar school and until I was in early high school. Um, and he, he was a fascinating character, uh, especially after, you know, Pius the Twelfth, you know, who was more austere and he was a great, great man, but there was a joviality with John the Twenty Third that even a little kid could relate to that, you know, I just didn't see and, and I didn't know anything about the heroism of Pius the Twelfth. Um, but John the Twenty Third was the Pope that I really became more aware of. Um, what, what reflections do you have on his canonization coming up? He was a great human character who put an entirely different face on the papacy and the Catholic Church uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, I think there's been an enormous amount of mythology created around yes. John XXIII. He was a man of very deep piety and very traditional piety. Uh, when you his certainly see that in his uh, biography. Right, his when his Diary of a Soul came out, yeah. I think people were, were quite shocked. And yet there was a deep and warm humanity in him that actually made him something of an odd duck in the papal diplomatic service, the Vatican diplomatic service of his time. That is where he spent most of his clerical career in the uh, Balkans, in Turkey, which were not exactly the A-level uh, postings. And he went to Paris after the Second World War as nuncio as a kind of slap at the French. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the Second World War, de Gaulle wanted to get rid of the nuncio who had stayed in, uh, in Vichy with the French government during the, uh, during the Vichy period and during the German occupation. Yeah, so I, he I, had to be gotten rid of. I don't think a lot of folks understand that. The, you know, that de Gaulle was really in charge of the free French. Who were outside of France. Right. And, and the Vichy government was stay, located in Vichy, France. Right, and they were the collaborationists, and the Holy See had diplomatic relations with them. So there was a nuncio there, and de Gaulle said he has to go, and insisted on that. Pius XII said, all right, if you want to get rid of this guy, we're going to give you this peasant from the north who's been <laughs> running around the Balkans and Turkey for the last 25 years. And of course, uh, Roncalli, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, was John the Twenty-Third's name, was a tremendous success in Paris, uh, was made a cardinal at the end of his time there, and given the Patriarchate of Venice, which he would not have been given had he not gone to Paris, as a kind of end of career, thank you, gold watch, Good job. Whatever. Yes, yeah. And then, of course, and, and uh, also to let people know that there was no retirement of bishops in those days yeah, right. required at 75. So he was getting so up he, there. He goes to Venice expecting to spend the rest of his life there. And five years later, he's elected a pope, presumably to keep the seat warm for a younger man uh, in a few years' time. And then he proceeds to have a very consequential pontificate of only four and a half years. I mean, people don't remember that John Twenty Third was elected in late October 1958 and died in June 1963. Right. This was a very short run. But during that time, he accelerated the transition of the Catholic Church from the Counter-Reformation Catholicism in which you and I grew up and in which all of our viewers over 50 years old grew up into the Church of the New Evangelization mm -hmm. announced by John Paul II. And that acceleration took place through the Second Vatican Council, which was summoned by John the Twenty Third. Mm -hmm. So he is a terribly important hinge figure uh, between the Church, the mode of being Catholic, 
that existed from the late 16th century to the middle 20th century to the mode of being Catholic, this church of the new evangelization, in which all of us are called to be missionary disciples of the third millennium. Now, I think it's a brilliant symbol to have these two men, John the 23rd and John Paul II, canonized, formally recognized as saints, on the same day because it was John Paul II who completed the work of John the Twenty-Third and the work of the Second Vatican Council by giving that council an authoritative interpretation. And that was, this is a council about the church's rediscovery of itself as a communion of disciples in mission. That's the bright thread that connects the 16 documents of Vatican II. We are a communion of <coughs> disciples in mission. And that was the thread that John Paul II and the Synod of 1985 found, and that allows us to read uh, the work of the Second Vatican Council properly. That's why the two of them are, in a sense, the bookends of Vatican II. You have John the Twenty-Third, who has the insight and the courage to launch this process of reflection on the part of the church. And you have John Paul II, who in a sense completes the process and, and reignites the new Pentecost that John XXIII hoped the council would be for the church. And we, what do we have a new Pentecost for? We don't have a new Pentecost just so we can feel good absorbing the graces of the Holy Spirit and the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit. The new Pentecost is for mission. After they receive the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, what do they do? They go out and they preach the gospel. What are we to do after a new Pentecostal experience? We are to go out and preach the gospel and be witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ inviting others into friendship with him. You know, one of the problems that we've seen uh, since the 60s is that what began as very small differences oftentimes widened uh, within the church. And you'll have some folks trying to hoist the flag of John the 23rd and say, we're for change, while others hoisting the flag of John Paul II, we're for going backwards. And that's not, neither one of those is true. It's all nonsense. It uh, is. It's all uh, nonsense. It's and a politicization it, of both of them. Well, it's, these are just false storylines. Mm -hmm. uh, John Paul II, in his opening address to the council, the famous address mm -hmm. in which he talks about history. Mean John twenty third. John twenty third. sorry. Yes. Uh, history is the teacher of life, we don't need prophets of gloom. He also says the whole purpose of this council is to preserve and propose the fullness of Catholic faith. Right. That's what we have these things uh, for. Uh, John Paul II was the first modern pope uh, in the sense of a man with a completely modern intellectual formation and cast of mind. Um, a man with a, a really deep insight into both the ambitions, the noble ambitions, and the real faults of modernity. And the two go together. You can't separate these two things. Exactly. Uh, and you can't separate these two personalities. I think it's, it's a very, very false view of the last 60 years of Catholic history yeah. to talk about the John the 23rd Church and the John Paul II Church. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. Exactly. It's His Church. In which both of them would say. Both of them were utterly committed to that and indeed gave their lives to that. Exactly. You know, and, and you know, I started seminary uh, just a couple months after he died, so September of 63. And it was one of his earliest, John the Twenty-Third's earliest encyclicals about making sure seminarians 
were well trained in Latin right. and were, were, were able to speak it that formed the course of studies I had so that we were learning not only to read Julius Caesar, but how to do conversational lang Latin so that we could have classes in Latin all the way through the course. That's what he was preparing us for. Didn't quite work out uh, yeah. as he thought, but he did that. And then I think even before that, his first encyclical was on the rosary. Uh, <clears throat> so he had <clears throat> that kind of piety, <clears throat> as well as, you know, an encyclical about social justice. You know, all of that was combined in his personality, not, yeah. he didn't exclude any of that. Yeah, no, he was deeply formed in the traditional counter-reformation piety of his day, and yet he had the pastoral insight and the human insight to understand that the world had moved into a new historical and cultural phase, and the church had to be prepared to respond to that. And that's what the council was for. <coughs> Excuse me. One, one of the things I also have noticed is that uh, after the council, I and mean, we certainly had a lot of rough times uh, in the church since then, but there's a major difference in that uh, for, between us and some of the other uh, denominations and communities and stuff uh, who never had a council, and they've gone ad hoc dealing with modernity and frequently giving into modernity, accepting as normative for their church, moral teaching, say birth control and then abortion and a wide variety of other issues. And they've declined yeah. tremendously, you know, doing that ad hoc, whereas Vatican II gave a vision that for those who read it, and not just heard about the spirit of Vatican II, but read the documents, could capture like John Paul II captured and passed on. And that's an important gift that John the 23rd gave the church. I frankly find it absolutely mystifying why anyone looking at the religious sociology of the past hundred years would still propose today that loosening the doctrinal and moral boundaries of the Catholic Church is a path into the future. <laughs> the churches, the religious communities, the Christian communities, the ecclesiastical communities, whatever the technical term is we use here, that have done this are hemorrhaging members and are dying. Exactly under the conditions of the late modern and now postmodern world, it is only religious communities who can tell you this is the framework within which we live that are moving forward and that are growing, that are not uh, dying. That's the same of religious communities within the church. You look at communities of sisters or uh, communities of priests or seminaries where it's clear that we, we embrace the full symphony of Catholic truth, they're the ones that are growing. Exactly. Places that are still in deconstruction mode or do-it-yourself mode, they are dying. This does not take a genius to figure out what's going on here. Yeah. Now, it is also true that it takes a lifetime to embrace the full symphony of Catholic truth. We're all going to make a mess of this from time to time. We're going to make bad decisions. That's why we have the sacrament of reconciliation. I know what I tell people all the time, no matter how bad the economy gets, I never run out of sinners, and my confessor is in full agreement. Well, I, and, and the more we understand that, the more we understand that the real question is not how little do I have to do and believe to stay on the reservation. Right. The question is how much of the rich, complex tapestry of Catholic truth have I made my own and have made that which shapes my life? 
uh, Catholicism is a great <coughs> lifelong adventure. Exactly. And it's not a question of simply signing off on a few basic propositions and then doing it yourself from there. That's demeaning yourself. People have greater possibilities than that. And I think both John the 23rd and John Paul II understood that there is no contradiction between proposing the fullness of Catholic truth and proposing the divine mercy as the remedy for all of our inevitable failures in living out the fullness of Catholic truth. And you know, when you look at that not only traditional piety of John the 23rd, you know, his, his um, you know, uh, autobiography is just wonderful. You know, I remember reading that years ago, and uh, it was, you know, really showing his growth in holiness, uh, not through a boasting way, just by dealing with the various struggles that he had, and his diary, just talking about his diary, and his proposing of piety, like praying the rosary, and as key and doing it well, and that in between him and John Paul, Vatican II picks up that sense that the call to holiness is universal. Right. And John the 20, John Paul II picks that up and moves forward with it and gets it out there as well. This is, there's a unity mm -hmm. in that call to holiness. Yeah, another interesting point of tangency between these two men who are going to be canonized together is their experience of the Second World War. Yes. If you go back to, if you read a serious biography of John the 23rd, which is frankly not that easy to find, mm -hmm. but if you, if you piece together what you can do from mm -hmm. what biographies are available, this was an interesting case. I mean, this was the smartest kid in the village. I mean, real peasant background, but he's the smartest kid in the village. Right. He goes out to the seminary and he gets immediately into the ecclesiastical ladder climbing business uh, of the Italian church of that time. He's ordained at age 22 or 23. He becomes a bishop secretary. He's a chaplain during the First World War. But he, you know, he's moving up the ladder. He's a conventional, pious, convinced Catholic but he's a rather conventional careerist. Mm -hmm. Then he enters the papal diplomatic service and he goes to these strange places, the Balkans, primarily Orthodox, Turkey, primarily Islamic, overwhelmingly Islamic. Then he experiences the awfulness of the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, the German persecution, the Nazi persecution of the Jews. He helps Jews escape. Yeah, he, he, he gets he, a whole different view of how the world works. The world doesn't work exactly the way uh, early 20th century Italian ecclesiastical careerism would lead you to think. And so he becomes that native peasant humaneness, which was always there, suddenly gets real scope. And then he goes, as I said, to France, then to Venice, and then to the chair of Peter. And he's a different kind of guy at that point. Same thing is true of John Paul II. Um, I am often asked, what did you learn about him that you didn't know before you started these two books? And the answer is, one, the enormous importance of his father in his life, which I had not really grasped before. And the second that was the experience of the Second World War as the absolutely formative experience of his life. Yes. The man the world came to know was formed in that cauldron of occupied Poland between 1939 and 1945. And I sometimes describe this uh, with a geological analogy. Uh, I said it's somewhat like all of that stuff that goes on beneath the crust of the Earth's surface. There's violence, fire, all sorts of ugliness is churning around down there. And sometimes it explodes out. 
volcanic eruptions, lava flows, destroys things. But something else forms from all of those pressures under the surface of the Earth, diamonds. The brightest, hardest substance known to humanity. Something that is so hard and sharp that it can cut through what we think is impermeable. And that is what happened to Carol Wojtyla. Under those pressures, he became a kind of diamond who could cut through, to extend the metaphor, the Berlin Wall with the power of faith and the power of example, the power of his own conviction about the dignity of the human person. So for both of these men who will be canonized on April 27th, the Second World War was a crucial formative experience. No, it's um, uh, an important part of the story that is really brought up that Pius XII was helping Jews get onto ships that would then go to Istanbul and Roncalli was taking them and helping them to come to safety. And that, you know, that's why uh, Pincus Lapid and others have pointed out that Pius XII, with the help of Roncalli and many others, saved more Jews than Churchill, Stalin, or Roosevelt. You know, that, that, that this was a big part of their job and realizing mm -hmm. that their need to come to the aid of people in fantastic need uh, and desperate need. And they're not Catholics, that, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. They, they recognize inherent dignity. It's another, there's another interesting connection here that you remind me of between Pius XII and John XXIII. There's, there's one school of Vatican II interpretation that says there was this fantastic rupture between yeah. Pius XII and, and, and the Council of John XXIII. Well, the fact of the matter is that with the sole exception of the Bible, the single most cited source in the 16 documents of Vatican II, you look at the footnotes, mm -hmm. is the magisterium of Pius XII. Pius XII, in his encyclical on the liturgy, his encyclical on biblical interpretation, and especially his encyclical on the mystical body of Christ, made possible the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. Exactly. So you can't chop this stuff up yes. into discrete and disconnected moments. It's, it's a flow. And sure, there are ebbs and flows in the flow, and there are crises and confrontations and unpleasantness and whatnot. But it is one connected story. Yeah. And I think you know that this is uh, why the canonization of Blessed John the Twenty Third and of Blessed John Paul the Second is not about trying to placate liberals and conservatives. Yeah, right. It's about two popes that were inherently fantastic leaders of Catholicism because they were both fully Catholic leaders. <laughs> That's, it's just yeah, that it's, simple. It's the canonization of two men of heroic virtue who were enabled, empowered to live lives of heroic virtue because they were radically converted disciples of Jesus Christ who was at the center of their lives and who could inspire the church they led out of that radical discipleship. And, you know, this is, um, this is again, I started seminary during, you know, or, or right after uh, John the 23rd died, and the council was still going on, and I certainly have gone through <laughs> all these changes. Uh, and I can remember the day that John Paul was elected um, and his running down three flights of stairs to pass chocolates out on the street. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I haven't had a Polish pope before. Sure, so, right. you know, the, all of this, uh, it's, it's been an amazing, exciting thing. And I think with their canonization, we should see that going back to what they said, not what people say about them, going back to understanding their holiness, their heroism, 
and their, their love of Christ and of the church is our task. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, this important introduction to this and also want to give you all blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of his ways by his peace. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you know, we can bring you guests like George Weigel and all the other guests, as well as present to you the canonization process itself and the celebration because this network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we will pay all of our bills too. Thank you and God bless.